Well, hey, good morning. Good to see you. My name is Luke. I'm uh, one of our pastors and uh, part of our preaching team. And uh, yeah, I just want to extend my welcome. And for those of you watching online, welcome to you as well. Uh, We are back, as you just figured out, in the Gospel of John. We finished preaching through the book of Nehemiah over the summer, finished that last week. And I want to give you a little bit of a a sense of kind of where we're going for the fall. This is actually week 33 of John. Uh, We've had some breaks along the way. Uh, But for the next four weeks, we're going to be in uh, finishing John chapter 12 today, and then John chapter 13 over the next few weeks. Then we're going to pause and we're going to do a series called Countercultural Convictions. This is actually a series that we started back in March 2020. And something happened in March that uh, made it uh, hard to uh, continue that series. And so, but we're going to resume it and, uh, and, and uh, basically look at, at the number of things. We're going to look at kind of what is our approach as Redemption Church to engaging with culture? How do we, how do we as Gateway uh, and Redemption counter culture? We're going to look at issues of gender and sexuality and uh, how we approach the vulnerable, how we approach generosity, how we think about salvation, all of which are things that we as Redemption have strong convictions about that run counter to how the, the world around us thinks about it. So that's what we'll spend six weeks on in September, kind of early part of October. And then as we head towards Christmas, we'll go back into John uh, chapters 14 to 16. And so that's where we're going. Um, I actually kind of like that as we look at the cultural issues, it's going to be surrounded by who we see Jesus to be in the gospel of John, because I think that's the most important thing that the culture needs is Jesus. Amen? And that's what we need too. And so that's why we're going to continue uh, to look at him here this morning. I, I went a couple weeks ago to, uh, um, this was really cool, went to a baseball game and, and it's fun to go to a baseball game, but what was special about it was it was my son Hank's first major league game. Uh, he's four years old, I've got uh, four kids, three daughters and then Hank, and Hank's really into baseball. He especially likes the Cubs, or at least he liked the players that uh, played for the Cubs until they got traded away like two days ago. Um, and so we went to a Cubs and D-backs game and it was like a typical D-backs game, it was mostly filled with Cubs fans. And, uh, and we had a great time. And, uh, you know, he did really well. I, I wasn't sure if he'd make it all the way through the game, but we kind of, you know, there were different things to change it up and do. And, and one of them was around the seventh inning, I sort of snuck down like you're not supposed to and like uh, got us some seats like right behind home plate and uh, kind of snuck in there. And, uh, and around that time, w- one of the concession guys selling beer came around and he started saying, last call, last call. Hank was like, what does that mean? I said, well, buddy, it's, it's beer, and this is like the last time you can buy beer. You can't buy it after the seventh inning. They don't want you to have it, you know, before you leave, and he didn't understand any of that, but, but last call, right? This is your last chance. If you want something, if you want in on this beer I'm selling, the guy was saying, here's your last call. Well, this part of John chapter 12 is Jesus' last call. He's saying, if you want in on this thing that I came to bring, last chance, and, and, and what's significant about it is this is the last time that Jesus is going to speak publicly in the Gospel of John. From here on out, uh, chapters 13 and following is going to be Jesus with his disciples privately behind closed doors as he's preparing them for what's going to happen. It's the Last Supper. That's what we're going to begin to look at next week. And then it's Jesus going to be in front of the crowds as he's crucified. But this is the last time he's, he's talking to people. And Jesus, up to this point, has been offering himself. He's been saying, I want you to know me, and now here's his last call. He's done some serious calling up to this point. Uh, John, who was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of his closest friends, has recorded this book because he wants us to see Jesus and see how Jesus came to call us, to reveal who God was. Here's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. This is not Jesus' first call. This is his last call. He's been calling. Jesus came to reveal God. This is, this is, so, this is so amazing, right? A lot of times I think people sort of think if there's a God, he's out there somewhere, but he's unfindable. You got to have some secret knowledge or you got to pray a special prayer or you got to you know, have access to some particular guru. And only if you like work really hard and navigate this difficult path, could you possibly find out who God is? No. God has revealed himself in Jesus. He's come in Jesus. He said, you want to know me? Here I am. And what John records in the rest of this book is all of these ways that Jesus is showing who God is. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. It's interesting, the Gospel of John also, it starts with the same words that the book of Genesis starts with. In the beginning. 
Why? Because what John's trying to tell us is that Jesus is the, the same God who said in the beginning, and Jesus is the one who's, who's bringing in new creation. New creation is broken into history in Christ. And so Jesus is doing all these signs that point to this reality that God's making all things new. So the first sign he does, we saw in chapter two, this is just to kind of help us catch up if it's been a while since you've thought about John. In chapter two, his first sign is to go to a wedding and as they run out of wine, he takes water and he turns it into wine. That's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, that, a lot of these other miracles Jesus does, you go, okay, I get it. Someone was really hurting. It kind of, but water into wine, what's the deal with that? Here's the deal with that. Jesus knew that to run out of wine at a wedding was a huge thing of shame on a family. So he's removing that shame. But he's also saying life in the kingdom of God, it's like a party with great wine. And then in chapter four, he does another sign. There's an official who has lots of power and lots of authority, but he kind of runs out because his son is on the brink of death. He's got an illness and he's about to die. And kind of like we get to the point sometimes where it's like, okay, I, I, something's going on in my life and money can't fix it and my network can't fix it and the resources I have can't fix it. God, it's that man comes to Jesus and Jesus heals this official son, brings him from the brink of death to life. In chapter five, Jesus goes to this pool called Bethesda and there's all these people there and he finds this man who uh, had been lame, unable to walk for 38 years. And as he looks around and he sees all these people in need, he singles out this man and he says, rise, take up your mat and walk. And the man stands and walks. Then in chapter six, Jesus provides bread to all these people who need it. And this is a picture of what God had done to the people of Israel in Exodus where God provides manna, bread in the desert. And now here Jesus is providing bread in the desert to tell us, hey, I'm here to feed you. I'm here to nourish you. I'm here to strengthen you. In chapter nine, Jesus encounters a man who was born blind. And isn't that a picture of life without God? He's born blind, can't do anything to fix it. And Jesus gives him sight. And then in chapter 11, he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead to the point that the body was about to stink. Jesus powerfully says, Lazarus, come forth, and out he comes. Those are the signs. What, what has all this been about? Well, think about this. These signs tell us that God has come in Christ to remove our shame and to give us a picture of a kingdom of God party. Jesus is the one who came to bring us from the grips of death, to bring us out of blindness, to bring us out of our inability to walk with God. Jesus is the one who brought us out of death and into life and then feeds and nourishes us. That's who Jesus is. And John writes at the end of the book, he says, I, I barely have scratched the surface of all that Jesus did. In fact, he did so many other signs, I don't even have room to write them all down. But the ones I've written, I've written so that you would believe in him. So what's been the result up to this point? Well, the result is some people have believed. Some people have experienced Jesus and they've seen him and they've seen him not just with their eyes, but with the eyes of faith. And they see that he is who he claimed to be and they trust him. So some people believe. A lot of other people, I think you could describe them as they're impressed with Jesus. They don't believe him, they don't really trust him, but they gotta go, man, this guy's really something. He's doing miracles and he's working power and I wanna see more. But there's a lot of people who've rejected him. In fact, they've decided to kill Jesus at this point. Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 27, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm about to go to my death because I've been rejected by the people I came to to save. The Puritans had a saying. They said that the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And Jesus has come and he's revealed who God is. And this is his last call. And so what we're going to do today is really kind of two things is, is number one, we're going to say, what was the core message of Jesus? If John is summing it up and saying, last call, last chance, get in on this, what was that core message? And the second thing we're going we're gonna to ask is, if that message is so great, why have so few people embraced it? Why so much rejection? So that's what we're going to look at together here this morning. Let's pray. Father, we need your help now as we open your word. We ask you to speak to us. 
God, I especially ask that as we look at your core message that you would give us eyes of faith to see who you are. Give us gratitude for the grace that we receive to see it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, You know, a lot of times we just sort of go verse by verse in order, uh, 37, 38, 39. What we're going to do today is I'm going to kind of flip it and actually go to the very end of the chapter at Jesus' core message and then go back to the other part. So the first question I want to ask is what was Jesus' core message? What was this last call? And this is verses 44 to 50. If you have your Bible, make sure you follow along here with me. What was Jesus' core message? Because that's what John's doing. John is summarizing this. He's saying, here it is, last chance. Here's Jesus' core message. First, anyone can get in on this. Look at verse 44. It says, and Jesus cried out. He heralded. He proclaimed. He announced. This is not Jesus getting behind closed doors, getting in a small group, getting with the people who have special access and insight because they've bought him off with good works or with money or with some other thing. This is Jesus out in public saying, you want in? Come. Come. All right, look at what he says. He cries out and he says, whoever believes in me. You want to believe? Whoever. It, you, you're invited. Anyone can get in on this. My, my guy, Hank, he, he will at dinner sometimes. We'll be sitting there with the six of us. And he'll sometimes say, hey, everybody, I have something I need to say. But this is not for mom or Mary. <laughs> and then he says it, right? And it's like, buddy. We all heard it, right? Like, you know, and he's not, but, but he's like, this is not for you. This is just for them. That's not Jesus. Jesus saying, anyone, you want in? Here it is. That's his core message. Here's the second part of his core message is that if you trust me, you're trusting God because I speak his words. Look at verse 44. Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. In other words, if you see me, Jesus is saying, you see God. You're you're not just trusting me, you're trusting the Father. Verse 45, and whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. If you trust me, you're trusting God. Jesus is the revelation of God. You want to know who God is? Look at Jesus. Why? Because he's speaking his words. Look at verse 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given me, has, has himself given me a commandment. What to say? and what to speak. One of the dangers that I experience as a preacher is there's, there's times where, um, whether it's here kind of, of preaching on a Sunday or it's just in life as I run into you different places, is sometimes people ask me my opinions on stuff or they want to know what I think. And, and, I, and I sometimes forget that, um, and sometimes I have to say like, hey, listen, I'm not speaking for redemption. I'm not speaking for the elders. I'm not speaking for the pastors. I'm speaking for me, right? And when I'm preaching, I'm I'm trying to preach in light of what God says and trying to be faithful to him. I'm trying to have my words be the words of God for us. But, But I just am aware that like my ability to perfectly represent God, let alone perfectly represent other people, like it just, it doesn't work. And yet Jesus is totally confident about this. Jesus is consciously saying, oh, Everything you hear from me, it's from God. I mean, think about the audacity of that. Like, that's the kind of thing that could, I don't know, get you killed. I mean, this isn't Jesus going, yeah, I'm just a good teacher. I have a few suggestions and tips. He's going, no, no, no. I'm God, and I'm speaking for God. If you trust me, you're trusting him because I'm speaking his words. Here's the third part of Jesus' core message, is I came to bring you out of the darkness. This is reiterating a theme that showed up over and over in the Gospel of John, verse 46. I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. I'm the light. Jesus has over and over said, I'm the light of the world. I want you to not remain in darkness. And look at that word. Isn't that an interesting word? Remain in darkness. Get what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying humanity, apart from me, is in darkness already. Sometimes we sort of imagine that we're a blank slate or we're morally neutral and Jesus is going to kind of come and put the, you know, his finger on the scale. No, no, no. We're in darkness. 
We're already there. We're already wreaking havoc on our lives and on the world because of the darkness we're in. When, when I was a little kid, I think I was eight or nine years old, and um, my parents would usually park their cars in the garage, and for some reason, and this was like, I really don't remember them ever not parking in the garage except for this moment. And they had a kind of a hatchback Honda Civic that they parked out on the street, you know, along the curb. And in the middle of the night, there, I mean, just was this ear splitting, <laughs> huge crash, completely totaled the car as this, this guy sped into the car. And what we found out later was what had happened is this guy was coming home from a party and he thought somebody was following him. So he was trying to get away. And in order to get away from the people he thought was following him, he turned off his lights. And sure enough, <laughs> he turned off the lights. He couldn't see. <laughs> Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying sin has turned out the lights on us. And we're crashing into stuff. That's our condition. That's where we are. We don't even have to choose that direction. We're just there already. And what Jesus is saying is, I came to turn on the lights. I came to show you a better way. I came to show you and to give you life that you can't give yourself. I came to bring you out of the darkness. Here's a fourth part of Jesus' core message is, I came to save the world, not judge it. I came to save the world, not judge it. Look at verse 47. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I've spoken will judge him on the last day. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I, I, didn't, I don't need to judge you. You're already judged. You're already in the darkness. And if you don't listen to what I say, then all the words that I've spoken to you that are the words of God... On the last days, you stand in judgment before God. Those are all going to be called to the witness stand to say, hey, listen, you had a chance and you didn't listen. But Jesus is going, but for now, that's not, I'm not worried about that. I came to save you. I came to rescue you. I came to love you. I came to forgive you. I came to give you new life. That's what Jesus came for. This is a God of mercy. This is not how we often view God. We view God as just sort of, you know, on a razor's edge, just ready at any point to crush us. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus, this is the same Jesus in Matthew 23 says, oh, Jerusalem. He looks out over the city that's rejected him. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that stones the prophets and rejects those who are sent to her. How often I've wished that I could gather you like a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. But you would not listen. That's the heart of God. Listen, Jesus didn't show up with a clipboard and a checklist. Jesus showed up with an engagement ring. And what he's saying here is he's saying, I'm down on my knee. The last few days, we were in Flagstaff, kind of a last trip before the kids restart school, and somehow or another, we got talking about how I proposed to Molly, and the kids love hearing that story. And afterward, Hank and Mary were taking turns proposing to each other, right? <laughs> and they would get down on the knee, and will you marry me? And here, here's what I want to tell you today. That's the image we should have in our head of Jesus. That's what he came for. He said, he's down on his knee, saying... Will you marry me? Will you have me? I came to give you life. I came to make you new. I came so that we could enjoy one another forever. Right? This is actually the imagery that this Bible gives us. The Bible says that Jesus is like a groom and that his people are like a bride. That's what this is. You want a picture of Christ? It's that picture. It's all summed up pretty well in a motto of a church that I really like in Nashville called Emmanuel. They have a mantra, the Emmanuel mantra. I am a complete idiot. My future is incredibly bright and anyone can get in on this. That's a pretty good motto. Right now it starts with I'm a complete idiot, right? It's saying I know I'm in darkness. I know I don't have it together. I know I've rebelled against God. I know that I just don't make the wisest decisions. I'm an idiot but my future's incredibly bright. Why? Because Jesus is the light of the world and he loves me and he's with me and he's for me and anyone can get in on this. All right, isn't that good news? I mean, that is such good news, which raises the question, that sounds so amazing. Why aren't more people 
saying yes to the proposal. And, and that's a key question theologically when you think about John and what he's trying to do. Because what he's saying is, hey, God has entered into history. He had promised for hundreds of years to come as a Messiah to the Jews. And now God has come. And they say, no, nope, not interested. How do you explain that? And that's really what he's addressing in verses 37 to 43 is this question, why don't more people embrace it? And the first thing we have to say of why don't more people embrace it, why don't more people say yes, is it's not because they haven't seen. <laughs> this is one of the most striking things when you read through the Gospel of John, is that people see all the things that would make you think, oh, if they see that, they'll believe, and they still don't believe. Right? It, it's that crazy verse in chapter 11 when Lazarus is raised from the dead and the next verse says, many people therefore believed. Many? That should say everybody. Well, well why not? Like, like a lot of us go, well, if I saw someone rise from the dead, I'd believe. How do you know? Because all these people saw sign after sign after sign after sign and they didn't believe. You're better than them, you're smarter than them. So it's not because we haven't seen enough. It must be something else and that's what he explains in verses 38 and following. The second thing he says is that the nature of unbelief is not to believe. You don't believe because that's the nature of unbelief. You, 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 can't, you can't see if you don't see. Now, now, what he does that's pretty interesting here is in verse 38 and in verse 40, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. So I want to do some kind of Bible nerd uh, stuff for a little bit. Some of you, you know, you won't be into this, but some of you will. And uh, I kind of like it. Uh, so, and I'm talking. So, I don't know. I guess that's what we're doing. So, uh, what, what's interesting to me is John, because I'm just kind of imagining John, who's like, he loves Jesus and he's close to Jesus and he's seen all these things and he's going, how do I understand this? How do I make sense of the fact that this person who I love so much, who I think everybody should trust in, how, how, how do I make sense of the fact that so many people don't? So what I imagine he did is he kind of went back into his Bible and went, is there something else here that explains this? And the answer is yes. And he finds help in the prophet Isaiah. So verse 38 is a quote from Isaiah 53, verse 1. And in Isaiah 52, uh, God is revealing his servant, his Messiah. He's saying, here's the one that's going to come, and he's going to bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And it's this, like, you see this wonderful servant of God coming to show up to Israel. And then chapter 53, verse 1 says, Lord... This is what he quotes in verse 38 here. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And the answer is, no one. God sent his servant. Who embraced him? Nobody. And then the rest of chapter 53 is that servant suffering at the hands of the people who've rejected him. And in so doing, fulfilling the purposes of God. It says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned everyone to his own way and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The servant comes, people don't want him. It leads to his death, which eventually leads to the good of everyone who will believe in him. One of the ways just, just by application that this encourages me is I, I find there are times in life where I think to myself, Maybe in a relationship with my kids or with uh, somebody that I work with or whatever it is where I think, if I could just say it the right way, then they'd get it, right? And it's like, like okay, if I, if I got my heart in the best frame of mind and I picked the right time to talk about it and then I used the best illustration and I had the most kind of compelling persuasion if I just could say it the right way right do some of you have that where you kind of think like I'd love to have my kids do this differently or I'd love I have these friends that don't love Jesus I'd love man if I could if I could just say it the right way here's what Isaiah 53 is saying God said it the right way and it didn't work. God himself can say it the best way. 
and still be rejected. So, so do your best, try to prepare your heart, try to be smart about how you approach these conversations, but, but quit kidding yourself that if you just do it perfect, it'll work. No. Here's another reason why more people didn't embrace it. Verses 39 and 40 tell us that God hardens the hearts of those who will not believe. So first, he quotes from Isaiah 53, and he says, God revealed himself and they didn't want him, right? Which is really the point of verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, right? That fulfills Isaiah 53, verse 1. But then he says, verse 39, therefore they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So the first part of Isaiah seems to say that they don't want to listen because they don't believe. The second part seems to say God is actually not allowing them to listen. What's going on here? Well, here, uh, John's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, what's happening is, is Isaiah gets a vision. He's brought into the throne room of heaven. And he sees these angels flying around. And, and God is on the throne. And the train of his robe fills the temple. And the earth quakes. And the angels cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And it's this, it's this compelling vision. And Isaiah, who's like a professional communicator, says at that moment, woe to me, I'm undone. Right? He sees God in his glory. Woe to me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. What is he saying? He's saying the best, when I see God in his holiness, the best part of me, I realize, isn't good enough. And so, he's, the, the, the coal is touched to his mouth, and it's a picture of his forgiveness. And then the voice from the throne says, I, I need someone to go out and tell people about me. Who shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And then is this verse. Okay, well, here's what you need to know. As you talk to people, they will be ever seeing and never perceiving. Their hearts will be hard, their eyes will be blind, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I'd heal them. And Isaiah goes, wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me I'm gonna go out there and tell everybody who you are and they're just not gonna listen? And God's like, yes. And he goes, okay, I got a question. How long do I do this for? And uh, God says, well, you're never gonna stop doing it. And that's what he's quoting. So if that's what Isaiah experienced, we shouldn't be surprised that this is what Jesus experiences. But what do we do with this reality that it says he blinded their hearts, he hardened their hearts? Because here's what we think. If we, if we go, man, so you're telling me they don't believe because God wouldn't let them? That, isn't that what it sounds like? He blinded their eyes, he hardened their heart? And, and if, if you read that, the natural response is to say, that's not fair. And I want to give you three reasons why I think that we shouldn't say that's not fair. The first one is this. Verse 37 says clearly that the people are responsible. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. They didn't want to believe. They wanted to put him to death. Why? Because verse 43 says they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So this, this passage, while it talks about how God did in fact harden them and make it where they couldn't see, the reality is they didn't want to see. Here's a second reason. Throughout the Bible, God's hardening of people is always presented not as cursing morally neutral people but as giving rebels what they ask for. And the best example of this is, is in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, the people of, e of Israel are enslaved in Egypt. And Moses shows up to Pharaoh, who is enjoying lots of economic gain from free slave labor. And Moses says, let my people go, let my people go. And over and over and over, despite God doing sign after sign after sign, Pharaoh, it says over and over, Pharaoh hardened his heart. It also says, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It also says, 
And God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And it takes 10 different signs for Pharaoh to finally relent, let the people go, and then even after he lets them go, he tries to chase them down again. So the question is, who's responsible for Pharaoh's hardening? Because it says Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened his heart. God gave Pharaoh what he wanted, which was a hard heart. And God gives us, rebels, what we ask for. And what do we ask for? Darkness. Why? Because we're already in darkness. Here's what a pastor and commentator, James Boyce, says. He says, in terms of salvation, it is hardly necessary for God to blind anyone. For men begin blind and come to Christ only when God intervenes to give sight to them. So verse 37 tells us they're responsible. The overall biblical description says they're responsible. And then here's a, here's a third reason, and, and uh, Seth Trout, one of our other pastors, has really kind of helped me see this, is that until you and I emotionally come to terms with the reality that what is fair is for God to send everyone to hell, until we come to terms with that, we'll always think that God's unfair. But that's what the scripture declares. No one is righteous, no, not one. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one seeks God, not even one. The wages of sin is death. All of, see, see, this is the thing we do. We go, well, I want, I want God to be fair. Careful. No, you don't. Because what's fair, if the wages of sin is death, and we've all sinned, then that means we all get death. We don't want that. And so God, for sure, in his grace, allows some people to see, just like Jesus heals this man born blind. But we can't look at, the, at people who experience hardening and blame God for it. Here's the last thing that you see from this text, is that sinful man loves the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. There's a description in verse 42 of some of the religious leaders who it says did believe, but for fear of being kind of kicked out of the synagogue, kind of kept quiet about it. We'll actually see later in the book that some of those guys, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea in particular, they do go public with their faith. But what is it that keeps people from believing in Jesus? Verse 43 says, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Friends, I... If you, if what you really want, if what you really live for is comfort in this world, if what you really want is the approval of people, if what you really want is for everyone to think, man, she's impressive, he's impressive, if what you really want is to be on the right side of history, however history currently defines it at this moment, if what you really want is for all of your choices to be affirmed and celebrated. If that's what you really at your core want, then you don't really want Jesus. You want what you want. And Jesus is gonna propose, and Jesus is gonna call, and Jesus is gonna invite, and you're gonna go, not for me. Here's how C.S. Lewis describes this. He says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. You hear what he's saying? There are people who embrace Jesus, who come to Christ and say, yes. Oh, you've bent down on your knee. Oh, you've come to me. Yes, I'm in. Thy will be done, Jesus. And everyone else, what, what judgment is, what hell is, is God saying to them, okay, thy will be done. You wanted life without me? You got it. You wanted to not be infringed by me? You got it. But friends, Jesus is on his knee. And the, the, he's got the ring out. And he's paid a heavy cost for this. 
not three months' salary, but his very life, his blood, the creator being scorned by his creation because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but would have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us in Christ, for inviting us to live with you in your light and in your goodness forever. God, when we're honest with ourselves, we know that we have doubts and we have struggles and we do love other things often more than we love you. And so we thank you for the grace of Christ that opens the eyes of the blind, that gives life to the dead. Thank you that you nourish us and strengthen us and revive us. And God, for anyone here today that needs to know you and needs to trust you, God, I pray that you would remove the blindness from their eyes that they would embrace you, that they would surrender to you, that they would say yes to you. God, thank you that you're faithful. Thank you that while we turn away and turn away and turn away and turn away over and over and over, you don't stop pursuing us. Thank you that this is not a one-time shot and then it's over. That you keep coming after us with grace. Help us to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.